Hello and welcome to Introduction to Cognitive Processes. I am Ark Verma and in this week of the course, we are talking about problem solving. So, in the last lecture, I talked to you a little bit about uh, particular strategies of solving problems, heuristics and algorithms. Uh, in today's lecture, we will move slightly further and look up at some traditional approaches uh, to uh, problem solving. We will talk about research from the Gestalt approach and we will talk about research from the information processing approach. Now, the Gestalt approach, if you remember uh, in history of psychology, if you have taken a course on psychology earlier, uh, the Gestalt psychologists like Wolfgang Kohler, Kafka and those kind of people, uh, they basically uh, believed in uh, a particular theory and the theory uh, could be just summed up in one of the things, uh, in one of the statements and the statement was like, uh, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. So, the idea is you have to look at the holistic picture and the holistic picture uh, gives you much more information, things put together give you much more information than their tiny bits uh, you know uh, independently or separately. Now, uh, the Gestalt psychologists were not only interested in perception, but they also did a lot of work in areas like learning and memory and problem solving. Uh, they also were interested in uh, working uh, about uh, attitudes and beliefs and so on and so forth. So, uh, today we will just uh, talk a little bit about their contribution towards problem solving research. Now, the Gestalt approach to problem solving basically uh, emphasizes on two things. It emphasizes on the fact that how are you representing the problem in your head. Uh, if you have to begin solving a problem, you have to figure out a way of representing the problem in your head correctly. Remember, we have talked about this a little bit in the first lecture on problem solving and today we will just try and do some more demonstrations uh, that is uh, basically going to uh, you know help you see the importance of representations. Uh, also, uh, uh, the Gestalt psychologists believed that solving a problem uh, would involve a degree of reorganization or restructuring this representation. It is not like that you can build a very inflexible and immovable uh, representation of a problem and you are going to solve it 100 percent of the time. A lot of times, uh, you will be required to change your representation, you will be required to uh, restructure your representation uh, in order to be able to solve the problem. You know, it is more like you have to look at the problem from different and uh, you know from different angles uh, or you have to you know shuffle the problem around, uh, put it in such a way that makes it easier for you to solve the problem. So, these are the two uh, major aspects that kind of uh, in some sense uh, summarize or highlight the gestalt approach to uh, solving problems. Let us see uh, how it uh, really works. So, the first thing is representing the problem in mind. Now, solving a problem, the gestalt uh, psychologists believed that uh, solving a problem is very uh, closely influenced by how it is represented in the person's mind. How you are looking at the problem will uh, you know almost uh, define in some sense how you are going to solve that particular problem. And we can just uh, demonstrate this by a, a very simple example and this uh, example was uh, a problem posed by Wolfgang Kohler back in 1929. Now, this is the problem and uh, you can look at this figure, the figure is borrowed from Goldstein's book, uh, but uh, you can look at this uh, circle here, you are seeing that there is uh, you know triangle there, the line, uh, the diagonal of the triangle is uh, the hypotenuse of the triangle is called the x. And then uh, what has been asked is, uh, if the length of the circle's radius is r, uh, what is the length of the line x? So, what you have to tell is, you have to tell the uh, you know length of line x uh, and you have to compute it. So, one of the ways to represent this problem is that a circle with the vertical and horizontal lines uh, that divide the circle into four quadrants with a small triangle in the upper left quadrant. So, with a small triangle in the upper left quadrant, this is how you can verbally describe it. Now, is this definition, is this uh, statement of the problem uh, going to be very helpful uh, for you uh, to solve this problem? You can just use this problem slide, you can you go back to this uh, statement and just try and figure out whether it is helpful, whether you can uh, you know solve this problem in such a way. After you spend a couple of minutes, after you spend a couple of minutes dealing with the problem in such a way, uh, what you can also do is you can change the last aspect of the problem and instead of a triangle, you could just say that a small rectangle in the upper left quadrant is there and the diagonal of the triangle is x, which is running between the two corners. Uh, look at this uh, triangle as uh, basically a rectangle that is uh, having the quadrant uh, as uh, two sides, the boundaries of the quadrant as two sides. 
So once you realize that this diagonal is actually the radius of the circle, uh, and that both diagonals of the you know triangle of the rectangle are of same length, you can very easily conclude that the length of x is actually going to be equal to the length of r. So very easy uh, to solve this particular problem just by restructuring the way you were looking at the problem. So the important aspect here is the solution could just be arrived at very quickly by first perceiving the object uh, completely and then representing it in a slightly different way. This is what is referred to as restructuring. So we talked about the representation part and this is how the restructuring of that representation uh, would lead you to uh, uh, effective and a quick solution. So this is the solution. If you wanted uh, graphic aid, this is how uh, you look at it, and you'll see that r and x are exactly equal to each other. Another important concept in the Gestalt theory of uh, solving uh, problems: this aspect of insight. Now the Gestaltists believed that sudden realization of a problem, uh, you know, the, a, a lot of times people have a sudden realization of a problem's uh, solution. Uh, they assume that people solving uh, you know, uh, particular problems were sometimes experiencing insight because the solution seems to come to them all of a sudden. So they will be thinking, 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 thinking and suddenly all of a sudden they will just say that okay, now the solution is there. So there is no gradation, you know, there is no, uh, we are talking about the initial state and the goal state in the last lecture, there is no progression from an initial to the goal state here. It is suddenly that you are at the initial stage and one minute passes and you are at the goal state without this proper methodological planning. This is also referred, this has also been referred to as the aha moment or the aha experience that suddenly you get a solution of a particular problem. Now Metcalf and Weeb basically they did this uh, uh, research, they wanted to uh, differentiate between insight problems where the solution will come up uh, you know almost uh, instantly and there is no proper method towards the thing and a non-insight problem. And their basic assumption, their starting point of their experiment was that there should be a basic difference in how participants feel when they are working on an insight problem versus when they are working on a non-insight problem. So what they did was they predicted that participants working on an insight problem in which the answer is supposed to appear suddenly should not really be very good at predicting how near to a solution they are. On the other hand, participants working on a non-insight problem, which involves a more methodological process, a methodical process, uh, would be more likely to know that whenever, you know, to know how far or how closer to the final solution they are. So this is uh, what the two kinds of groups are and this is what their, uh, you know, assumption is. So they tested this hypothesis, they wanted to test this hypothesis by giving participants insight problems, I will just show you uh, the examples and non-insight problems. And while these people were working on these insight problems, uh, they were asked to make warmth judgments. So warmth judgment is like uh, the closer you are to a solution, the higher your warmth rating will be. So if you are very close to a solution, your, uh, uh, you know, your warmth rating on a 1 to 7 scale could be 6 or 7 even. Uh, when you are far from the solution, your warmth rating would be somewhere between 1, 2 and 3 and something like that. So while they were working on this uh, uh, solution, uh, they were supposed to, uh, you know, give this uh, uh, judgment of worms every 15 seconds. And this is what they, uh, what the task was. Now let us go to the problems. Uh, two of the inside problems are presented here. You can look at these figures. Uh, again, borrowed from Goldstein's book. Uh, you can see uh, there's in the figure A, there is a triangle problem, and uh, the triangle problem basically says that uh, in uh, the fewest uh, steps possible. Uh, so the idea is basically that show how you can uh, you know move uh, three of the circles to get the triangle to uh, point to the bottom of the page. You can look at the triangle, the triangle is pointing towards the top of the page. You just have the choice of uh, moving three of the triangle, uh, three of the circles that constitute the triangle and you move those three circles in such a way that the triangle starts pointing to the bottom. That is one. The other problem is the chain problem. So there is a woman who has four pieces of chains, uh, each chain has three, uh, you know, links and the, uh, the thing is that she wants to join these pieces in a single, uh, you know, chain, in a single closed loop of chain. Now what, how, uh, what uh, the, uh, the problem here is that to open a link is uh, going to cost two cents and to close a link is going to cost three cents. She has only 15, uh, 15 cents and how is she supposed to uh, achieve this in just 
15 cents. Now, these are the two inside problems. You have to kind of think over them, think over them, think over them and it is highly probable that suddenly you will just get the solution in one sense. There is no uh, step by step uh, hierarchical uh, approach to solving these problems. You can kind of pause this and you know attempt to solve uh, these things. For the non inside problems, they just picked up high school algebra problems. So, problems like uh, 1 by 5 of x plus 10 is equal to 25 and you have to solve for x. Again, very straightforward, but there are steps in there. You know, you can move from uh, one step to next step to next step and two or three or four steps would actually lead you to the final solution. So, the results of their experiments indicated that the median warmth rating for all of the participants during the just, uh, you know, during the minute just before the solution is there. So, they kind of showed this and uh, for the inside problems, it was uh, observed that the warmth ratings remain uh, at a very low 2 or 3 until just before the problem is solved. Notice that I will show you the results very quickly. Notice that just 15 uh, seconds below the solution, the median rating is uh, very cold. It is uh, relatively cold. It is around 2 or 3. In contrast, for the in contrast, for the algebra problems, the rating is increasing gradually. So, this is these are the results you can just see here. Uh, the red line is the inside problem and the dotted line is the algebraic problem. You can see here that the you know um, the change from uh, minus 15 to uh, when the solution is achieved is uh, rather steep in case of the inside problem, but it is uh, relatively gradual, relatively step by step in case of algebraic problems. So this demonstration basically uh, you know uh, it tells us something about the difference between what in how inside versus non inside problems are achieved are solved. Moving on. The Gestalt psychologists believed that restructuring was usually involved in solving inside problems. So, they said that if you have to, uh, you know, solve an inside problem, you have to do a lot of shuffling of that representation, you have to do a lot of restructuring. So, they kind of uh, started to focus on devising these kind of problems. Their strategy was to devise uh, uh, such kind of problems and situations and make it difficult for people to achieve the restructuring that is needed. So, that they are kind of, uh, it is not methodologically possible to do it and they are kind of only inside uh, solvable problems. And they hoped to uh, investigate how people are solving these problems and by investigating that they hope to learn about the processes that are involved in problem solving and by uh, the kind of obstacles that uh, you know come uh, when people are uh, trying to solve problems. So, here again there is a solution to the triangle problem. You can see that there is two, uh, three dots, uh, three circles have been moved uh, and you can already uh, uh, see that the triangle starts pointing to the bottom of the page. This is uh, the one of the solutions. The other solution is here. Uh, again, you just have to uh, uh, use 15 cents uh, and you can uh, just need to open three uh, links and close uh, three links to basically be able to achieve this. So, 3, 3 is a 9 uh, in the uh, closing part and 3, 2 is a 6 and 9 plus 6 is 15. So, you are kind of doing it in just 15 moves, 15 cents. So, uh, this is the, uh, the kind of obstacles I was talking about. So, the kind of obstacles uh, that uh, you know uh, come up that kind of uh, are present when people are uh, solving problems uh, are uh, and then th there is a variety of obstacles that are there, but uh, one of the very common obstacle uh, one of the very common problems you will uh, see in people who are very uh, you know they are not very good at solving problems is that uh, of uh, fixation. Uh, and fixation basically is uh, somebody's tendency, is people's tendency to focus on a specific characteristic of the problem that keeps them from arriving at a So, suppose for example, you are uh, basically just uh, fixed at one kind of way or one method of solving a particular problem, you are not very open, you are not really willing to restructure the problem, you are not uh, really uh, willing to uh, think in more innovative ways and then it is highly probable that you will be stuck with the same problem for a long time. Okay. Uh, on the contrary, if you are very flexible, if you are open to looking at uh, the problem from different perspectives, you might be able to reach the solution uh, in a much more faster way. So, an, a demonstration is due. So, the, uh, the, the if you remember the very uh, old candle problem. So, uh, uh, this candle problem was first uh, proposed by Carl Dunker in 1945 and the candle problem serves as a, a demonstration of uh, how functional fixedness or how fixed, uh, fixation to a particular way of doing things can hamper somebody's problem solving abilities. Uh, just to give you a cue, uh, if you remember uh, there is a candle, there is a matchbox and there are these uh, pins, tacks uh, as you may call it 
and the uh, uh, problem is basically to be able to uh, you know fix the candle to the wall in such a way that no uh, wax falls on the ground. So, this is basically the problem statement and th these are the three kinds of materials that are given. So, what Dunker uh, did was they, he did this experiment with two groups of people, two groups of participants. One group was presented with a small cardboard box containing the materials, candles, tacks and matches and the other group was presented with the same materials, but outside the boxes, everything was outside and the boxes were empty. So, what they found was uh, when they compared the performance of the two groups, they found that the first group found solving this problem in, uh, much more difficult than the second group. Now, how is it happening? What is the problem here? Why is the first group finding it more difficult? If you just look back at this uh, thing, uh, and I am sure a lot of you would have come across this problem and a lot of you know the solution already. The idea is that you just attach the empty part of the box uh, to the wall using the tacks and just keep the candle in the match box. So, that whenever e even when the wax is uh, melting, it just falls within the box. That is pretty much what the uh, solution of the problem is. But the first group are basically uh, not being able to see this extra use of the match box. They are just uh, thinking that match box is used to contain and match box cannot be uh, you know uh, stuck to the wall. So, this functional fixedness, this fixation uh, with using the box in only one particular way is actually hampering their uh, approach to solving this problem. Adamson in 1952 uh, uh, repeated the same experiment, repeated Duncan's experiment and he also got the same result. Participants who were presented with empty boxes were twice as likely to solve the problem as compared to participants who were presented with boxes as containers. Because boxes as containers is kind of uh, priming and uh, you know uh, uh, reaffirming the fact that boxes can only be used as containers and cannot be used to attach to the wall. So, this is this is just a demonstration of how people think in very fixed, very inflexible ways to approach problems and sometimes kind of you know they are uh, far worse for it. There could be another demonstration of the same uh, concept and this demonstration comes from Myers uh, two string problem and the problem is, uh, is this. So, there are uh, two strings attached to the ceiling and uh, there is a chair and there is a pair of pliers and the idea is that uh, the person has to tie these two strings together. The strings are created such that it is very difficult to be able to hold two of them together. So, how would somebody solve it? This is difficult uh, and uh, you know uh, it basically requires some sort of innovative thinking to solve this. I am just pausing here for a minute. You can actually reason out how to do it. Moving on, let us say solve this problem the participants would need to uh, actually what they uh, needed to do is to tie the plier to one of the strings and just create a pendulum and just you know, move the string. When one of the string moves, the participant could already be holding one of the other strings and just link it using the pliers. So, the idea is you can just you know when these strings are moving towards each other, they are going to cover a lot of distance and then they can come close to each other where you can actually tie them. Two important things uh, happened in this experiment. 60 percent of the uh, participants could not solve the problem because they focused on the usual function of the pliers and did not think of using the pliers as weight using which the strings could be swung. When Maya set the string into motion accidentally you know just to give them a clue, uh, 23 out of the 37 participants who had not really solved the problems after even 10 minutes has passed proceeded to solve it within 60 seconds. As soon as the clue was there, they saw that okay, the strings could move and when they move, they could come closer to each other, they could actually solve this. So, in gestalt terms, what is happening? The solutions to the problems are occurring when the participants are restructuring their representation of the problem and of also how to achieve the uh, solution. Both the problems discussed were uh, discussed because of people's uh, were basically difficult because of people's preconceptions their mental sets you know a preconceived notion about how to approach solving a problem uh, and that is determined by a person's previous experiences. If your previous experiences are kind of uh, you know in some sense making you very inflexible uh, un unable to uh, you know look at uh, different possible options then there is a high chance that your uh, problem solving strategy will be less effective more time consuming uh, giving chance of more errors etcetera. 
The gestural psychologists were pioneers of problem solving research between 1920s and 50s. They described a lot of problem, uh, problems and solutions and they kind of illustrated how mental sets can influence problem solving and how creating of new representations or restructuring uh, you know, the given representations can contribute to getting solutions. Let us move on to a different approach now. Uh, the information processing uh, you know, uh, approach, the information processing paradigm started uh, long back around 1956 when Alan Newell and Herbert Simon, uh, they described uh, their logic theorist program. So, the logic theorist was basically a computer program which was designed to simulate human problem solving. This basically marked the beginning of a research program that basically uh, thought that you know uh, that problems could be solved using search mechanisms you know and it is not really unnatural to think of uh, you know solving a problem as a search mechanism we all the time we are using words like you know I am searching for a solution or I am hitting the dead end in my search for a solution. So, people generally do talk about it. So, what Alan Newell and Herbert Simon did was they, st uh, they conceived of uh, solving a problem as searching for a solution. And in that sense, they basically uh, devised a way of looking at how a problem has to be solved in terms of an initial state. I have been talking about this uh, again and again, an initial state which is conditions at the beginning of the problem and a goal state that is the eventual solution of the problem. Now, we will talk about this initial and goal state using the tower of the Hanoi problem. Uh, and uh, if you know this is what the tower of Hanoi problem is, there are three uh, you know poles and one of the poles, uh, pole 1 has uh, three pegs uh, arranged in ascending order of size and the goal state is basically that you have to move uh, the pegs to the last pole to the last pillar uh, using particular rules and the rules are uh, specified this are to be moved one at a time from one peg to another. A disc can be moved only when there are no discs on top of it and a larger disk can never be placed on a smaller disk. So, this is the initial state is here, the goal state is here, the rules are defined and now what you have to do is you have to move from the initial state to the goal state using these particular steps and keeping in mind the following rules. Now, this tower of Hanoi problem basically uh, you know was conceived by Alan Neville and Herbert Simon as uh, you know a sequence of steps. So, the idea is that there is an initial state and there is a goal state and there have to be a lot of intermediate steps, uh, states. So, each step you take you end into an intermediate state and then uh, you know you, what you are doing is eventually if uh, you remember the means and heuristics eventually uh, each of these steps will take you closer to the goal state. So, the problem starts with initial states and you have to make these steps. Now, the various states the intermediate states uh, here can be referred to as the problem space. I will just show you the problem space in a bit. Uh, this is what the problem space looks like. These are all the possible initial states built together and what you have to do is you have to start from 1 reach 8 which is your solution. Now, just note uh, a lot of times people would not have uh, visualized all of the problem space. So, basically what they are doing is they are kind of moving uh, in a sort of a defined uh, problem space which by the way they are not really aware of. What they have to do is it is like almost moving in the dark moving from the initial to the goal state by taking some intermediate steps. So, given all of the possible ways to reach the goal what the task of the problem solver is to figure out which moves to make and choose the correct sequence of steps because that is what is going to uh, take them uh, to the goal state in the shortest amount of time. Now, according to Neville and Simon, what the person has to do is the person has to search the problem space for a solution. What are the different possibilities that can be uh, uh, considered? What are the different moves I can make? Which of these moves will make the distance uh, 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 lesser? Which of the moves will take me further from the solution? Which of the moves will take me closer to the solution? Now, how is the uh, person, how is the problem solver supposed to do it? the problem solver according to Neville and Simon does what is called the means ends analysis. It is very similar to the means and heuristic we have been talking about in the earlier lecture. So, what the uh, problem solver does is he does a means ends analysis that is he kind of figures out and uh, you know uh, figures out a way and the primary goal of this analysis is uh, to be able to reduce the distance between the initial and the goal states. So, the idea is uh, how, how is this person going to do it? The person will again create 
sub goals or intermediate states and he has to move from one intermediate state to the other intermediate state uh, all the way uh, towards the goal state and the distance is uh, being reduced. So, you can see here so the participant basically has to move from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 and then towards eight, 9 uh, towards 8 which is the final state. There could be uh, different kinds of sub goals that uh, people can actually make. Suppose, I am just kind of uh, borrowing uh, uh, to demonstrate this. So, the sub goal one could be you know you have to first free up the large disk. So, can you can move it to the peg 3. So, the large disk has to be moved first and then you can just basically do it by you know uh, if you just look at here the idea is you have to first free the large disk. So, what you can do is you move uh, one of the disks to uh, you know you move the smallest disk to peg 2. Uh, then uh, you know you kind of move it uh, uh, further so that the large disk is uh, free to move to the last peg. So let me just read out uh, the kind of steps. So removing the small disk and placing it on the third peg, so smallest it goes to the third peg. Uh, then remove the medium disk and move it to the second peg. And then uh, you know this completes the sub goal of freeing the large disk. So now the large disk is free. Now you can move it wherever you want. But there is a rule that a larger disk cannot be placed on top of a smaller disk. So, how will you do it? Uh, the second thing is you have to now free up the third peg because this is where the large disk has to come. So, what you will do is you will pick up the smallest disk from the peg 3, put it on peg 2 because peg 2 has the medium disk. Now, on top of that you can pick the uh, keep the smaller disk. Once that is there peg 3 is free now you can move this to the uh, you can move this uh, largest disk from peg 1 to peg 3. This is one way done. Now, what you can do is you can just pick up the smaller disk, keep it back and the peg 1, uh, pick up the median disk, keep it on uh, peg uh, 3 and then bring the uh, smallest disk on peg 3. This is basically a very quick uh, solution to the Tower of Hanoi problem, but it is obviously a complicated problem once you start you know dealing with it in steps and start figuring this one out. So, again this is just a description of how the problem has to be solved. So, once one reaches uh, stage 5 in the problem space one can decide about how to uh, achieve the sub goal 4 that is freeing up the medium sized disk. So, once you have kind of done uh, a particular steps and you kind of take a pause uh, a step back see now how are you going to free this middle uh, disk and how are you going to move it. We can uh, and there are two possible options you can move the small disk to peg 3 or on to peg uh, uh, on to peg 9 that is stage 6. I will just go back here. So, uh, when you are uh, actually at sub goal 5, uh, now what you have to do is uh, you have to uh, free up the middle disk. So, you can either move it uh, to uh, peg uh, 9, uh, peg 3 or you can actually uh, go to goal 6. So, again you kind of have to figure out what needs to be done to eventually reach the goal C. That is pretty much what the uh, thing uh, that you have to do. Now, these two possible choices, the choice is between moving the smallest disk to again back again to peg 3 or on to peg uh, you know or on to peg 9 uh, and that will be the sub goal 6. So, if you kind of uh, have this idea that moving uh, you know the disk to peg 3 is not really a good idea because it more blocks the medium size disk, you will not put the medium size disk on top of the smallest disk. So, it is not really a good idea because you know that will block the medium size disk. So, what you have to do is you have to kind of move the smallest disk back to peg 1 as I was saying which makes it possible to move the uh, medium size disk to peg 3 and then you can bring the smallest disk here. So, there is if you kind of uh, you know take a step back and uh, look at this much more closely there are this sequence of steps that you have to take. Each step is supposed to take you closer to the final solution. So, why is the tower of Hanoi problem important you know the tower of Hanoi problem is important because it demonstrates the usefulness of the means ends analysis you know with this setting of sub goals and the approach that needs to be applied and this is what can apply to real life situations as well. If there are bigger problems at hand if there are more complicated problems at hand what you really need to do is draft the problems into smaller smaller goals and kind of you know keep achieving those uh, smaller goals in order to eventually reach the largest goal. That is pretty much how uh, the means and analysis would work out. One of the main contributions in that sense of the Neville and Simons uh, you know approach is that it provides a way to specify the possible pathways from the initial state to the goal state. You take this step you are moving further from the uh, goal state, you take this step you are moving closer from the goal state. 
but research basically has shown that there is obviously more to the you know uh, problem solving than just specifying the problem space that is there are so many other things as well so this is uh, all from me uh, about uh, the information processing approach to problem solving and the gestalt approach to problem solving uh, we will uh, move to the next lecture where we talk about some other approaches and some other aspects of problem solving thank you